Okay, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Revort, and today I'm going to talk to you about a little bit of infrastructure uh, that we built with uh, JavaScript, very relevant to this time of the afternoon. Um, and I just want to thank uh, David, Nana, and everybody. I mean, this is just an amazing venue. A huge. I, I'm having a hard time not trying to take advantage of this entire stage. Um, it seems like the lights are right here. But um, so thanks everybody. It's great to have this uh, opportunity to be here to share this stuff with you. So I'd be remiss if I didn't start my talk by saying "Ole," which um, <laughs> is kind of this inside joke that developed. Uh, after, I think it was Nuno Job who posted something on Twitter. It was wine, 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 something. Ole! Like, tongue in cheek. And then, um, so I started to append that to almost uh, any of my uh, celebration uh, tweets. Uh, and it's become a thing between me and David Diaz. So anyway, ole! So a little bit of background about uh, why I'm here and what I'm talking to you about today. Uh, so I work for Pearson. Uh, I'm familiar with Pearson. We're a, a global education company slash publisher. Uh, you know, so big company, big enterprise. Uh, and I don't know how many of you work for big companies and big enterprises, but a lot of times there's lots of process and it's difficult to change. Uh, and we were sort of in this situation where, uh, at least at my quarter at Pearson, we were just stuck in the mud uh, with lots of process around how things actually get to production. So uh, it would take about two to five days, literally, to go through the gauntlet of integration environments, uh, integration tests, uh, processes, meetings, calls, to get something uh, to production. Uh, and, and I was baffled. I was there for uh, about a year, sort of working th you know, through this, this mud and felt really, you know, really stuck. Uh, so I got to the point where uh, something just really needed to change. And I, I, I was just... It was like, we have to do something drastic, right? Because we're not going to get there in incrementally, right? We're not going to like just speed up in the mud. We need to do something very different. So uh, I was at the point where extremely frustrated. And I remember standing up in a meeting one day and just said, damn it, we need to be able to deploy multiple times a day. And it's either going to go really well, I'm going to get fired, or I'm going to quit. And I'm cool with all three of those. Like, either way, I just hope it happens fast. Like, whichever one, you know, because I don't want to drag this out. Um, and that kind of started it. It was like, you know, kind of threw the gauntlet down, and then I'm like, okay, well, how do I actually, how do I do this? What are we doing here? And uh, I can't go into all the details of that, but it, it did involve me pulling out my personal credit card and spinning up all sorts of virtual instances and expensing them and, like, the expenses actually getting paid the first month and the second month, and, and it was like, oh, I'm kind of on to something, and that spiraled, and then eventually it got merged into something more official. Uh, but what I was basically talking about was continuous deployment, you know, which is the act of deploying um, software basically immediately after, after it's done and ready, as long as it uh, you know, passes your sort of test pipeline uh, and, and goes straight to production. So why wait, get the thing to production? Um, so if we could do that, and that was our sort of lofty goal and go after that, um, at least it would be significantly better uh, than it was uh, currently. So, but, you know, when you start to think of the actual mechanics of deployment, right, and think about what happens when you actually deploy something, you know, more traditionally, you, you might push your package, let's say git push or whoever, to a server, and then you restart the service. And, and you know, you obviously typically don't have one server, you may have, you know, an army of servers spread across zones, etc. But that's sort of the process, right? You push to it, you get the package, and you restart the service. But, you know, you really need to, and when you do that once every two weeks, or once every month, or whatever that is, or at 12 at, you know, midnight, it's really not that big of a deal if, uh, if, you, if you impact users for a small blip of time. Because you do, when you restart the service, any connection that's in flight is going to be broken. And that manifests itself as uh, images don't load, JavaScript doesn't load, CSS, whatever else you're serving, API calls, like for that instant, it fails. So if, if you're going to be doing this now, let's say every day, or five times a day, or 10, or 50 times, or every time someone pushes a commit, you really need to be able to upgrade with zero downtime. What that means is literally no downtime. So no connection drops, no interruption, no disruption whatsoever from your users, including stealing a whole bunch of capacity from them um, which, which, which causes sort of problems and ripples. So that at least should be the goal, right? It's sort of, uh, the other image of this would be, you know, how do we pass the baton? If the baton is like an upgrade or a deployment and you're running on the track and someone sort of matches your cadence side by side and you pass the baton and they, and they continue to go. Um, so how do, you, how do we do this? Uh, and then secondly, if you're going to deploy 
let's say 50 times a day, you really need the effort to deploy to converge to zero. So that doesn't mean that the duration of the deploy is zero. You know, it could take 15 minutes, 10 minutes, as long as it takes, and you want to get that time down as well. But ultimately, the, the level of human effort and human attention needs to converge to zero, which, you know, sort of just begs for end-to-end -end automation. So, uh, you know, we asked the question, how? You know, we kind of said, let's do this, uh, but really, how are we going to execute this? And even, how do we do it in, in our environment, uh, which is very heterogeneous? So it's public cloud, private cloud, uh, bare metal stuff, it's... We, we've been doing Node for about, about three years. So we have lots of you know, growing Node infrastructure, but we have Node, we have Java, we have Python, we have some Erlang, uh, we have some .NET. We have a, a lot, and it's very heterogeneous. So how do we go about doing something like this and set a model for how we could do it across that, that stack? And you know, typically, when you would, when you would, let's say you would attempt to do this, uh, especially historically, you know, you'd usually do something like this at a load balancer because you're, you're taking traffic at the load balancer and what you want to do is bleed connections away from an instance or a server that you'd like to, you know, manipulate, upgrade, take down, let's say upgrade and pull back up. Um, and, and, but usually, a lot of times, these load balancers don't have great APIs uh, and they're not very, uh, you know, sort of on the fly, tunable and configurable. But that's sort of the place where, where you'd go about doing this if you'd like to not drop connections. And then secondly, um, wouldn't it be great if instead of having to upgrade instances, uh, the, you know, the, the servers that you have serving your traffic and sort of having to delicately do this as you're serving that traffic, that you could deploy to a whole other, you know, let's say bridge in this case, if it's, a, you know, you use the construction uh, analogy that you can work on one bridge, divert all the traffic to the other that can handle your capacity, upgrade and repair that one bridge, and then divert all the traffic over so then you could do it again on the other side. And so this wasn't very practical uh, some years ago because infrastructure is expensive and you know, most people can't afford to have an entire copy, second set of, uh, that, that can serve their entire capacity uh, running side by side in their data center. But you know, the advances in virtualization and the cloud and uh, burst sort of on-demand capacity makes this affordable because you really can scale this up only at the time of deployment and then when you're done, you can scale it back down. So uh, here, sort of to introduce the, what, what came out of this, uh, and it's this project called Thalasso, which internally used to be called Spindrift, if you know me and I've mentioned that to you before. Uh, and this is basically a, a rewrite of that. Uh, and what it is, is it's three node modules and uh, HA proxy. And you may ask, uh, you know, well, this is a JavaScript conference. Why don't we use Node, the, you know, the king of IO and asynchronousness uh, to do our, our proxying for us because there's a whole slew of uh, node HTTP proxies, there's Bouncy, there's um, node HTTP proxy, there, there's sort of others, and it's really easy to create your own too. Um, however, HA proxy has a couple of benefits. One is that it has this ability to recycle itself um, without dropping connections. So when what you can do is pass a new configuration, it spins up a new process, and it has this orchestration of passing file descriptors over such that it'll let current in-flight connections finish and everything else will go over to the new process. And it can do that and it, does it, it actually does that very efficiently. Um, two, it, it's just this, it works. It's sort of tried and true, it's a stalwart of, you know, if you can't really get a better software-based uh, proxy. Uh, three, it, uh, it performed a lot better and it was much more consistent, consistent, a lot less jittery. It's super capable from a load balancer perspective. And then lastly, I could sell it. So I could go to uh, people in my organization and say, well, I want to use HA proxy as a load balancing tier. I'm going to create all these Node.js processes to orchestrate the whole thing, but don't worry about that. That's not going to be serving traffic. And this is mainly, you know, uh, two, a year and a half ago, let's say. I think if I said that now, I might, I could probably make the case for Node. Uh, I, I wouldn't though, I'd probably still do this because uh, it's worked so well and it's just been reliable. So three node processes. Uh, the first one's just called Thalassa, the name of the project. It's a server registry and a client. Uh, and then there's also a process called Aqueduct. There's a, a nautical theme here that was sort of uh, a tribute to Seaport, which is a substacks module that this used to use and then sort of has since inspired. Um, but Aqueduct is a process that sits next to each HA proxy instance, uh, has an API that exposes for configuring that HA proxy instance, 
uh, as well as manages the HA proxy process, uh, which actually incidentally uses uh, Third Eden's HA proxy module. If anybody's ever seen that, he just released that uh, within this last year. It's uh, sort of moved all my stuff over to that. Um, so props to him. Um, and then Crow's Nest, which is the uh, real-time dashboard. So let me just walk you through sort of how this works in some of the in a little more detail. So uh, at the core is this Salasa server, which is a registry. Uh, it uses Redis to store its registry information. It could be scaled horizontally, at least on top of a Redis instance. It in itself is a node process. So it has a, an a HTTP API, and it also uses uh, Axon, which is the sort of ZeroMQ inspired library that TJ Hollerchuk created. And then what happens is you, you, de you deploy an application, and that, as a client, connects into the server and announces itself and says, I'm app A at version 1, and I'm on this host and at this port. So it's available to be looked up in the registry. And then Aqueduct, it, it can, and you can have multiple of these uh, for as many HA proxy uh, servers as you'd like. That's a node process as well. Like I said, it, it exposes an HTTP, HTTP API. Uh, it connects to the registry as well and checks in and says, you know, I'm Aqueduct on this host and port and this version. And then it also uh, subscribes to any changes that are happening to the server for the, the types of uh, applications uh, that it's interested in based on its configuration. And its job is, again, to manage the HA proxy process and the configuration. And then, so in HA proxy terminology, things are split, split into front ends and back ends. Front ends bind to ports and take requests. Back ends are basically pools of servers that your front ends route to. So in this case, we have a front end listening on port 80. We have a back end at app A at version 1. And when a request comes in, it'll get routed to the front end, to the back end, and then sort of dynamically by the configuration through that aqueduct process that says, I will route to anything A at version 1 it routes to that instance. Um, so then all you need to do is spin up more A's at version 1. They'll check into the registry, and then they'll dynamically be added to your HA proxy pool. So that works in, in reverse as well. You can, uh, whoops, uh, before that. Uh, so there's also this process called Crow's Nest, which again is like a real-time dashboard. So that connects into the last server again, checks in, announces itself so you can look him up. He connects to... He looks at the registry and asks for what are all the Aqueduct servers, and then uh, connects to all of them with the server-to-server -server WebSocket, and then sort of is connected via the stream where it gets a, a live stream of the config, and the config is represented as a CRDT, which is one of Dominic Tarr's libraries, which is a commutative replicate data type. Um, so you can actually peer these Aqueduct and HA proxy servers and have them commute on that data, so it's like multi-master, so you can have like... You know, sets of these proxies. Uh, but it also gets streaming stats from HA proxy. So every two seconds, it's grabbing real time stats of HA proxy, streaming that down to that process and down to a browser client. And like I said, you can, uh, this goes in reverse, you can undeploy. So you can scale up and scale down just by spinning up applications that connect into the registry, and those dynamically get added to your HA proxy pools. And then when you're ready to deploy a new version of something, let's say A at version two, you can spin those up, they come, they check into the registry. You make an API called Aqueduct. That tells it now you're interested in version 2. All the connections that are sort of happening to version A finish off, and new connections come over to version 2. Uh, and that also lets you, it also lets you fall back as fast. So, I mean, this usually happens. It's, it, it's really dependent upon how long running your connections are, but the change happens within a second. So it begins to make you very brave. Once you can deploy sort of quickly, you can also roll back really quickly. So um, you could be a little bit braver with, with your deployments, knowing that you could instantly roll back. And then uh, that crow's nest process is, is kind of interesting because it, it's, it's heavily dependent on streams. So there's this server-server WebSocket connection between these two components, crow's nest and aqueduct, across every one of those. We're streaming stats and config and activity. And those are all like multiplexed over a SOCJS and like WebSocket connection from the browser to crow's nest as well, depending on you know, which pools you're actually interested in. So very similar to what Dominic was talking about, about replicating the data down to the client, that's exactly what we do. We replicate the actual configuration data from Aqueduct down to the client over a read-only stream. So uh, demo. <laughs> Let's see here. OK, so if I can just find my mouse, it's here somewhere.
Oh, there's my mouse. Okay, so this is uh, what Crow's Nest looks like. It's kind of hard to see, I apologize. Uh, as we all know, we're having some pro projector difficulties. Uh, but you can see uh, I have these three services up and running. I have Aqueduct Crow's Nest and the Philosophy server. Uh, and then what I'm gonna do is, down here, I don't expect you to see this. I'm just gonna spawn a bunch of processes uh, that are, with an app named LXJS. So I just spawned a bunch of node processes. They're at version one, two, and three dash alpha. You can kind of see them come up and registered here, a random number of those. And then uh, for proxies, I have my machine here that has ATA proxy running on it, and that's this one. It doesn't have anything configured yet, but we'll go ahead and do that real quick. Uh, so I have this tool here that just makes it easy to make you know, RESTful type requests. Uh, so I'm gonna create, whoops, hang on, I just, I'm going to create a, a backend first. So again, in the HA proxy terminology, this backend that has a pool server. So I'm going to say it's named LXJS. Its type is dynamic. It, it's going to subscribe to anything named LXJS, and it's going to route to anything version 1.0. And there's a bunch of other options you can pass in here for HA proxy configuration, times of lo types of load balancing. You know, the mode can be TCP, et cetera. So we'll go ahead and create that. And then return to 200. So if you... I'll flip back here now. Should see. Hang on. I refreshed. When demos go bad. Hang on a second. Great. <laughs> the demo gods are not nice. Okay. I don't know what happened. When you like suspend and unsuspend and suspend, uh, sometimes there's problems. Uh, so anyway, that's the back end I just created. And then uh, I'll go ahead and quickly create a Front end here, same kind of thing. I'm creating a front end. I'm saying it's going to bind to port 8888, and it's going to by default route to the LXJS back end. Okay. Should go over here, and now I see that, uh, that front end here. So uh, now, and I can see that, uh, if you can see this here, it's serving uh, version 1.0, and there's two of two servers that are up. And this is live HA proxy stats, as well as the live number of connections that are coming in. So what I'm also going to do is start up a, a server, and that's going to generate some load against this, uh, which will be here. So uh, I'll just start this off, and we should start seeing some load. So you'll see some, now the sort of connections are coming in. This is all real time. And what this is telling us down here is that it's, it's getting in serving requests from version 1.0. So the point here is, if now, uh, and I can, this is, I can make an API call to do this, or I could do this from the UI, I'm going to cut over to version 2. And what will happen is when I do that, you'll see these HA proxy stats kind of come in and change and look down and up because of the health checks. But what really happened is down here at the bottom when we cut over, if you notice, there weren't any errors on those connections, and there's actually some overlap here. And that overlap is connections to version 1 finishing and connections to version 2 being routed. So again, you know, I could flip over again, and we should basically see the same thing. We'll see um, that overlap happen. We'll see no dropped connections. And even though it looks like there's a red line there, it's not on my screen. Um, <laughs> strange. Uh, but um, so, you know, so this is working, right? So the theory is sort of is working. Uh, and then what I can also do is, let's say I just go and kill those, uh, that, the process that was serving that um, the actual node processes themselves, you'll just see this like huge barrage of errors uh, now as all these requests are timing out and stuff. So let's say you had to take down your server, you had to upgrade it, now you're getting over 400 uh, errors a second, and then we can go ahead and spin this up again, and you should see um, these things start to come up. You'll see them be re-registered and recognized. You'll see the HA proxy health checks and stuff start to come in, and now there's 10 of 10 servers available, and now it's sort of Pales in comparison to the number of errors, but that's actually serving requests now. Um, 
So that's the demo. Uh, there's also, you can see like live activity of when nodes went up and went down and, and things like when haproxy config was changed and when haproxy was restarted, which is helpful for troubleshooting and such. You can see all the um, uh, nodes that are running. There's a dashboard thing that makes it easier to, like with a more abbreviated view, so if you have multiples of these things. Okay. Now let me find the rest of my presentation. Okay, so um, I don't have much time. I think I'm just about at 20 minutes. I had to cut a lot of stuff out of this, a lot of details. I wish I had time to tell you this story because it's a really good one. Um, it's another Dominic Tarr story where he came and, and saved me, uh, but uh, I was using that CRDT library a lot more uh, at the time, and there'd be a community data shitstorm that happened on, uh, on Monday, August 26th. So if you're interested, uh, come talk to me. I'd love to tell you that story. Um, and so where is this stuff? Uh, it was just uh, opened and published on Monday. So uh, it's in the NPM registry. It's under the Pearson Education GitHub account. Uh, you can come take a look. I'm super interested to hear what uh, people think. And then um, that's about it. So thanks, everybody. 